Hey, what's going on? And welcome back to the Step It Up Entrepreneur Podcast. Your host, Thomas Keenan, coming at you today. I've got an awesome guest, Mr. Nick Hutchinson. Uh, we were just jamming here kind of behind the scenes, uh, just connecting a little bit and, and you know getting to know each other a little bit. Um, and Nick here has got an awesome book coming out on November 1st, uh, which is awesome. Going to welcome him to the uh, Published Authors Club, which is kind of cool because he also has a marketing agency that helps authors when it comes to marketing, uh, getting the book out, book launches, and so on and so forth. So, dude, welcome to the show. I've got a lot of questions to ask you as, you know, coming from, you know, what it took for you to become an author, what got you involved in marketing, and, and kind of what grew your team. Because right now, I think you just told me you got about 10 people on your team, which is awesome. And, like, just excited as all hell to have you here. So give me some background on you. You're a fellow dude from the Northeast like me. Uh, so even though, you know, it's kind of like Yankees, Red Sox bullshit going on, we got some things in common. Yeah, well, it just depends on who you root for in football. It depends. <laughs> there's a big difference between Giants and Jets in my head. So, <laughs> yes, yes. It depends but, on uh, uh, whose side of the family I'm with, because one side of the family goes one way. The other side of the family goes the other way. Yeah, well, the Giants beat up on my Patriots twice in the Super Bowl, so I'll never forget that. But listen, I um, when I was growing up, it might surprise anybody that can see this background that I was not much of a reader, right? So I didn't read personal development style information growing up. In fact, I didn't read much of anything. I was more of the athlete stereotype, not much of the academic, but that all changed around the age of 21 for me. And I have not looked back since. I've read hundreds of these books. I use them to improve every area of my life. And I'm on, a, <clears throat> I'm on a mission to spread the positive power of personal development books. I mean, I just believe in these things so much. I don't think life has to be so hard. And I think each book is an opportunity to step it up. Yeah. For yeah, sure. I really think that. For sure. What was the first book that kind of lit it for you? And you said, oh, shit, kind of opened your eyes. And you're like, man, this is the path I'm going to go down. I can't get enough. Yeah, I'll go back a little bit further. And then I'll tell you that book. So... I had taken an internship going into my senior year of college at a mm -hmm. local software company, but where I was staying that summer was about an hour drive to and from this internship. So I had a lot of time in the car and my sales director that summer, he recommended the world of podcasting, which I had never experienced before. So I started crushing these shows, like two episodes on the way to work, two episodes on the way back. And I was listening to all sorts of stuff. And what I thought was interesting was so many of the people that were at least financially successful, because that's kind of what I was focused on at the time, mm -hmm. they were giving some credit for their success to the books they were reading. Yeah. And here I am, like this cocky 20, 21-year-old kid, like you can't, you can't pay me to read a book. Mm -hmm. But is that really what it takes to be successful? Like why are all of these people giving so much credit to the books they're reading? So I heard the, the same names over and over and over again, the same book title names. Yep. And so the first book I decided to read was Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert mm -hmm. Kiyosaki. Yeah. And that's a first for so many people, I think, for a lot of reasons. But it opened me up to this world of financial literacy, the importance of money, uh, personal development in general, mm -hmm. how reading condenses decades of somebody else's lived experience into days of consumption. And I thought that was so cool. So, yeah, that was book number one for me. What about for you? Yeah. Um, Built to Sell was the first one that I read and uh, John Warlow is the author and it goes in, it tells a story about a dude who owns an agency and it alludes to it being like a marketing agency. And he was doing like one-off custom projects for all these people. And he finally found a mentor, a coach, a guide, whatever you want, whatever term you want to use in the book. And this person who was very successful said, Hey, here's, here's some of the things you need to do. Gave him just enough information where it kind of inspired him to go out there and make the changes in his company. And this dude went from, you know, being the guy who was pushing the buttons, pulling all the levers inside of his own company and running around like, you know, a chicken with no head, uh, no time for himself or his family kind of deal to someone who actually ran a business and got a lot of his time back. And at, the, at that time, um, I was I was balls deep into my second business at that point and, and was nonstop just in the business. And I could really relate with it. And I was like, oh, wait, there is a way for me to get out of this this complete rat race. Um, and then two or three books later, I got on to Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Rich Dad, Poor Dad at that point in time, I was 35 when I started reading, by the way. Okay. So uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad had been out for years and you heard about it from all multiple people. And finally I went and I, I, I listened to it just like you. I was doing a lot of audiobooks, and I was just like, 
blown away. Like, holy shit, I can't believe this information. Like, why was this stuff not taught to me in school, in high Fact. school? Yes. Yeah. So, you know, for me, um, I knew, I was one of the weirdos who kind of knew what I wanted to do before I got out of high school. And uh, I wanted to become a, a custom car audio installer. Um, and I did so. And I, I went after that and vigorously went after it. And it's a very technical trade. You, you, you can't be a dumb person to do it. A um, lot of hands-on stuff to do, but a lot of, of mental stuff with it as well. And um, started going down that path, got really good at what I was doing there and just focused all my time, effort and energy into learning the craft and the trade and the skill of that job. So much so that I spent from the age of, let's call it 16, all the way to 34, almost 35, was focused on becoming the best in that area. Mm. Right. And was I the best? No, I, I don't think anyone's the best in anything. There's always someone who can come in and do it better than you at some point. But I got pretty freaking good at it. <laughs> let's put it that way. Um, and then finally, I got to the age of 35. I started having kids. And it was like, hey, I don't want to be working 20 hour days anymore. There's got to be a better way. And um, went out, looked for some for some help as, and started hiring coaches. And, and the first coach I hired, worked with this dude for like six months because he, he wound up accepting a really high paying job as a, as a full-time CFO for a company. Uh, but the dude, I remember walking into his office and he's, his name was Richards, this big fat old white guy. <laughs> Richards like, well, let me tell you how this is going to work. And this is, by the way, I already paid this guy for the month. He's like, you're going to work with me. He goes, uh, we're going to review what systems and processes and software you have in your company. Oh, and by the way, you're going to read. It's not negotiable. I love that. I was good. Yeah. <laughs> so I do love it now. But at the time I was like, fuck, I got to read. Like I'm paying this guy all this money. He's making me read. So with that, I, I don't have it behind me because my bookshelf's cleared out. Usually I have it back there. Um, but the dude went into his briefcase and pulled out a copy of that John Warlow book and handed it to me and said, start here. And I looked at it and I said, I looked at it, I look it up and I'm like, when do you expect me to read this? Like I'm, I'm and at the time, uh, my, my second uh, business was a GPS tracking installation company. So we went on the road to clients locations, installing the tracking devices and dash cameras and commercial trucks. Mm -hmm. Like when, when do you expect me to read this? Like I literally work 12 hours a day and the rest of the time that I'm awake is spent driving to and from job sites. He's like, well, you know the title of the book. He goes, go fucking buy it on Audible. He goes, I'm not, I'm not paying for that <laughs> <to> you either. <laughs> so, okay, cool. So, all right, cool. I got the hint. Um, but jumped into that first book, and I probably tore through it in two or three days because I was just driving behind the wheel so much. Mm -hmm. And I, I heard the story, and it started to click for me. And I said, oh, okay. And immediately began to shift my focus from, hey, this is how you get better in the, in the trade, which I didn't need help there anymore believe it or not. Right. And I knew that transitioning into this new role, this new position, more of a leader of a company, I don't care what term you want to use, CEO, COO, founder, whatever, whatever suits you is fine for me. But I needed to become more of the leader in the company. In order to do that, I had to educate myself first. Mm. And books is how it was done. Yeah, man, I love it. Uh, that book, it sounds like it helped you work on the business instead of in the business. And that's, you know, I try to help people work on their reading skills instead of encouraging them just to read more. Because I think like where I am today and why I decided to write this book is that there were so many pieces of the of the puzzle missing when I first started my journey in personal development material. And like how I read and implement information today is wildly different than what I did back then. So mm -hmm. I want to help other people improve their skills yeah. so they could take better action. Because for everybody that read Built to Sell and didn't take action, you know, and actually took action, there's probably 10 that didn't, right? And you took action. Yeah. But like you're the rarity in that scenario. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um What's, what's your process? Like the people who are listening to the podcast now. So what is your current process now? Someone says, Hey, you need to read this book. All right, cool. Nick, you go, you grab it, you add it to your queue. Cause we all got a fucking stack of, uh, in the queue at this point. Right. You go, you go to the queue, you finally grab that book and you sit down you start jamming through it, whether you read it or, or you listen to it um, with uh, you know, audible or something. But what, what happens? Do you just consume the information and say, okay, cool. I'll put this to work sometime. And nine times out of 10, we don't. Or do you follow a, a process that you have in place to take the information, maybe learn it a bit more, write down what's important, and then implement? How much time do you have? Because I could talk about this. My, my whole process, 
right? Like the audio version of my book is like 15 hours long, right? So I've got a lot to share. Um, but at a high level, and then maybe we could like dissect certain parts of this process. Sure. At a high level, I think we need to choose the right books for mm -hmm. us and then set an intention for each book that we read. Once that's out of the way, I teach uh, some reading and note-taking techniques that I do follow with my own process. And then once I'm getting towards the end of the book, I go through a review process and I, de I decide what actions I'm going to take. Mm. From there, I'm rewriting my notes. Repetition is a form of, or, yeah, repetition leads to retention. And so there are a couple places that my notes get organized and stored in certain ways that I review them. Mm. And then as far as putting them into action, I only take action on the highest leveraged material that I learn. Mm. And I plug that into an activity tracker and I talk about it with my accountability group. So that yep. sounds like a lot, but in my book, Raz of the Reader, I kind of go step by step. Like how can you build this process yeah. and recreate it for yourself? Yeah. Um, so let's start at the very beginning and I'll, I'll just kind of tell you one of the things that I find myself commonly repeating. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I meet a lot of people that tell me, Nick, I don't have time to read. Yep. Right. And so what I'll normally say is, hmm, interesting. If I paid you $10,000 to read a book by the end of the month, do you think mm -hmm. you could do it? And they're like, yeah, Absolutely. of course I could. Yeah. <laughs> they're like, I could read five and they <laughs> fall into my trap. Right. So it's not a question of whether or not you can read, but it's a question of whether or not you value the books enough to prioritize them into your schedule. Just like you did. You were like, I work 12 hours a day. And then it's like, oh, Audio University, mm -hmm. that's pretty cool. Like now I can check out Audible and listen to information instead of music. Like I'm not a robot, but I will say that listening to the same song for the 1000th time is not going to get you closer to where you want to be in life, but the right audio book might, yep. right? So it's not a question of whether or not we can read, it's whether or not we prioritize it. So I'll kind of like pause there because I just threw a lot, mm -hmm. a lot at you, Um but I love asking that question to people. Yeah. So let me ask you, right. Let's get into the minutia a little bit. What, what, what does note taking look like for you when you're reading? What, what, you know, are you, are you a, Hey, I got a remarkable, are you a pen and paper kind of guy? You open up your mm -hmm. iPhone um, and, and drop in notes there. Like what does that process look like for you? And what have you tried to get to where you are with that today? So I'm not going to rain on the audible parade, but I will say that reading a physical paper book and taking mm -hmm. notes from a physical paper book is far more efficient for a number mm -hmm. of reasons. Number one, 80% of the inputs to our brain are visual, 80%. Mm -hmm. So that means all the other senses, including auditory, only make up the remaining 20%. So by default, if you read a physical paper book, you are more likely to retain and implement better information. It's also easier to take notes, right? It's mm -hmm. hard to take notes when you're in the car, you're multitasking, you're focusing on multiple things, and you're trying to listen and take notes at the same time. That's a tough place to be. Yeah. Now, I love audiobooks. I listen to probably 25 to 30 a year myself, mm -hmm. but I just want to kind of start there. So when I'm reading a physical paper book, I, I try not to multitask. I try to focus on one thing at a time. And I think reading and note-taking are two completely separate activities. Mm -hmm. So when I'm reading, I try not to task switch between the two. I try to stay on one focus at one time. And so if I find something related to my intention, like something I want to go back and revisit, I'll highlight it. I'll circle the page number, throw a little star or something like that. And then I'll go back at the end of the process and I'll revisit that takeaway. Then I can reflect on it, spend some time thinking about it and choose if I'd like to take action on it as well. Um, All right, so, so hold on a like second here. One. So you're one of them home slices who goes in there and marks the fuck out of a book, huh? <laughs> I am. Yes, I am. In fact, this will this will piss you off if if uh, you're like a book purist. I'm, I'm I so rip you with I it. I rip pages out. Oh no, that's what I do. Oh, Lord. <laughs> terrible, terrible. Yeah. Hey, oh you know, man. I um, yeah, it kind of drives me nuts, like internally with my OCD. But at the same point in time, I get it. Right. I understand that that's what works for you. And it's one of the things I try to I try to harp on with people, too. when we're having conversations like this just because that's not something that would work for me. I can't knock what you figured out, which works for you. So what I would tell the listeners is, OK, go try multiple different methods here and yeah. whichever one works best for you. Stick the fuck with it. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and listen, I on my social media and stuff, man, I can set people crazy by going like this and ripping a page out of a book. But here's what I love, right? Yeah. 
Yeah. Remember this, and I'll say it a few times, repetition leads to retention. So mm. I'll repeat that so everybody remembers it. If I find something that's like, oh my goodness, like what is this? I need to rip the page out, keep it with me all day long so I can pull that page out every time I fumble for my keys or my wallet or my phone and I'll just review it one more time. It's the most efficient way for me, right? Mm -hmm. I can always put the page back. <laughs> that's kind of like the tongue in cheek thing that I say to these people. Like I can put the page back. If you're rewriting your notes on a different piece of paper, you're the one wasting paper, not me. I'm mm -hmm. ripping it out and I'm putting it back. All so right. yeah, so my hold book on. Here's like they've been here. battle. This, this is 2023, right? We oh no, what are you going to say? Take a photo? <laughs> and we can take a photo of the den. <laughs> it's too slow for me, man. I try uh -huh. to get the phone away from me. No, I'm just playing. <laughs> I, that is a good solution. Um, you know, but you are right. Like I, I do keep the physical book with me. Mm -hmm. I keep a notebook. I mark it up. Yeah. And then at the end of the reading session, I rewrite all of my favorite takeaways from the book. And I'll, I'll look at that list and I'll say, not every action is created equal, right? Not every takeaway is created equal. Some of them are more valuable and have more leverage. So what 20% of my takeaways might lead to 80% of the outcome that I'm looking for? Yep. That's what I rewrite and try to implement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good old Pareto's principle. It applies everywhere. Absolutely. Love it. It does. Yeah. yeah. All right. So what's what's the latest book you've read right now? And what are some of the things you've already implemented that, that are pushing you or your company forward? So I just finished this book, Afraid, by mm -hmm. uh, a really cool, he's like a neuroscientist. His name is Arash Javanbacht. Mm -hmm. And it, it talks about how to manage fear and anxiety. Mm -hmm. Something that, you know, when I was younger, I had a lot of social insecurities, which created a lot of fear and anxiety for me. And it's still something that I, I deal with on a semi-regular basis. And one of my favorite takeaways from that book is that you can remove fear through repeated exposure. You mm -hmm. can become desensitized to something that normally is an input to your brain that creates fear. And you can kind of desensitize, like, like take fear meter and bring it all the way down through consistent exposure. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, this is kind of a, maybe a cheap example, but when I was younger, I had a ton of fear around my ability to communicate. Mm -hmm. Like I was one of those guys in, in class when you had to read, when everybody read in a circle and I would like count how many paragraphs I had, I'd have to read and I'd practice it five or six times. And like, yeah. like I was very nervous about my ability mm -hmm. to communicate, read out loud, things like that. Um, so the idea of me being on a podcast and having a conversation with a stranger, yeah. you know, we've gotten to know each other a little bit, but a stranger nonetheless, like that would have terrified me a number of years ago, but yeah. through repeated exposure, mm -hmm. I've been able to remove the fear. So that's one of the things that comes yeah. to mind. Uh, yeah, that's right awesome. now. Let me, let me, let me hit, hit you here for a second. So that resonates with me tremendously. All right. And I, I think this is something that we can drive home for the listeners of the show too. Um, here we go. We've got two guys who are sitting in front of you. We've got two business owners, right? You're from uh, Mass. You're a Mass Hole, Boston guy. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're you're not wrong. Throw that in there. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, you're about to become a published author. You work with authors. You have a badass podcast. You interview authors on a regular basis and like some big name people. Um, you are on podcasts like you are right now, promoting your soon to be released book on November first. And here I am, right? I've owned a couple of businesses. I I'm. A coach, I speak a lot. I'm sure you, you speak as well. Uh, I've got this podcast now. It's like three, almost four years in. We're 200 plus episodes deep, right? Which is awesome. And here we both were, these two dudes growing up who had anxiety issues and didn't want to get in front of people and didn't want to speak up and were afraid to communicate. Yeah. And the only way that I got better is uh, I started working on me, right? Through all these self-development books that you're talking about here. Right. And that the self development there led to a couple of wins, which breeds confidence. Then, okay, well, what I see all these other people that I'm hanging around with and they're more successful than me. I'm doing everything they're doing on the business side of things. Why, why are they still two or three steps ahead of me? Oh, they're taking care of themselves physically too. Okay, cool. So sit back and watch that for a little while. And then all of a sudden, boop, okay, cool. And now I got to go do that. Right. So now you add the reading, you add uh, taking care of yourself from a mental standpoint and, you know, practicing gratitude, stuff like that, morning routines. You add some physical fitness into it. You start getting your, your diet dialed in. You start, you know, cutting out some of the bullshit you're putting into your pie hole as far as junk food and alcohol and any other crappy substances. And now it breeds even more confidence. 
So here we are, two dudes who have no problem. Dude, I didn't meet you until, I don't know, was it 17 minutes ago, 20 minutes ago? It's the first time we ever spoke. And here we are having a very fluid back and forth conversation. And if we had met 10, 15, 20 years ago, like this just wouldn't have been a thing because we both would have been these, you know, two little hermit crabs trying to run away from each other because we were scared to talk. But the repetition, <laughs> as you were saying about the book, the repetition and doing it over and over and over and over again has made this comfortable for us. Yeah, we should both take a minute and celebrate that small win, right? Pat ourselves on the back. Uh, you mentioned to me before, uh, I was like, oh, yeah, in the gym, that's one of my hobbies. And you were like, me too, but it hasn't always been that way. So yeah. what was uh, when did you start paying attention to physical fitness and what you're putting in that pie hole of yours? Um, like you, I was an athlete growing up, played a lot of football, a lot of baseball. Uh, I'm a big guy. Uh, I'm 6'4". I was 6'4 by the time I was 15. Oh, wow. um, and... I graduated high school. I was probably like 235. I'm, I'm 275 now in, in the best shape of my life. Mm -hmm. um, I had let the stress of being a business owner, letting the stress of being a dad of three kids and, and married and all that crazy shit that goes on as we get older. Um, I let all of that take over and I put myself last for many, mm -hmm. many, many years, right? The business was more important. The, the family was more important. The whatever was more important before me. And I got to a point, I think it was 2018. Um, I had already been doing self-development, working on me for about two years or so at that point. Uh, got to a, a, a point where I was uncomfortable in my own skin. Right? Not taking care mm -hmm. of myself. Um, if I went and got my blood work done at that point in my life, my testosterone was probably in the dumps. Like, and I, I wound up getting it done probably a year after that. And it was like 232, which is terrible, right? Um, and I just felt uncomfortable in my own skin. I was so fat that when I bent over to tie my own shoes, I'd be out of breath. Right. So I was, uh, at my heaviest, I was probably 315 and like not a healthy 315, not, not yeah, without healthy. all the he looks, muscle. It looks pretty thick. He's all right. He's, it's not a bad 315. Like, no, I was a fat 315. Um, and I got real tired of just being out of shape and, and being winded. And, you know, I, I still own this service-based company where occasionally I'd go out into the field with my guys and work and, you know, get an hour into the job and I'm fucking sucking wind and trying to climb into big giant 30, uh, 53 foot long trailers. People don't realize how, how tall they are when you have to get up inside of there to go do work in them. Um, and I remember just being winded, trying to climb in and out of those things. I was like, this, this has got to go. So I um, went into New York City. I've told the story in the podcast, but I'll, I'll, I think it's 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 worth sharing again here. Went into New York City with my business partner at the time, and we were meeting a client who gave us a fuck ton of business. And we used to meet him every Christmas in the city because he lived in Jersey. We were from Long Island. We met in, in Manhattan. We'd go out for a nice steak dinner or something. And uh, my then business partner and myself got into it, a verbal altercation in front of the client. Not not my finest moment in, in my professional career or just being a human being, period, the end. Um, so left there that evening and uh, I was like, yeah, I ain't ready to go home. That's that's not a good sign. You're solo. You're in New York City. Uh, you've got a pocket full of fucking money. And I'm literally at Madison Square Garden. Right. So I just decided to go and walk into every bar that I could and have a drink or two or ten. And uh, wound up making it home the next morning at like 730 and just completely shit faced and hung over and, and didn't feel good. Um, that evening, when I had enough liquid courage in me, I reached out to a kid that I went to high school with. And, I, and this kid had been posting actively on Facebook that he was a, a personal trainer at a gym that was literally five minutes from my house. Reach out to him. Hey man, I need some help. I'm like, you know, reaching, you know, I've reached the point. Let me know what, what, I, what I need to do to sign up with you. And he goes, sorry, bro. Can't help you. I was like, oh, hmm. shit. He goes, but why? Because I just quit. He goes, however, he goes, uh -huh. there's this chick, Alex, that works there. She's awesome. Let me connect you with her. So long story short, I connect with this lady, Alex. Turns out that Alex uh, is a bikini uh, a competitor, All right? She's dialed the fuck in. She's 50 something years old at this point. She's a sweetheart. Um, and she just really is, is taking really good care of herself. So I wound up getting connected with her and, and I worked with her probably for two years or so. And in that first two years, bro, I swear, I swear to you, 
I didn't see a damn single physical change in the first two years. Hmm. And it was, um, it was almost disheartening, but I felt better, if that makes sense. So physically, if I looked at myself in the mirror, I was like, ah, I don't see any difference here. I also hadn't cut the alcohol and I hadn't cut the food intake, right? I just added the working out to the morning routine. Mm. So I was stronger. I felt better. My legs were stronger, that kind of thing. You know, like I wasn't getting winded as, as much. Um, but that was the beginning of me, like really going down that, that path. And then right around the two-year mark, I started working with wellness doctors, and um, if, if people are listening to this, if you have not worked with a wellness doctor yet, go and find one in your local area, uh, interview a couple of them because some of them are full of shit, just be, be honest about it, but go through the paces with those dudes because they're going to put you through a battery of medical tests that your insurance typically does not cover, right? This is, this is one of the reasons why you need to go out there and make good money for yourself too and not, not rely on the government or you know Medicaid or whatever the bullshit insurance that the state's going to give you when you claim that you're poor. Okay, because that's a whole racket over there too. Um, because they're going to give you the, the basics of the basics. But if you work with a wellness doctor, like I have one here in Dallas that I work with. It's it's a five thousand dollar hit, and he runs you through a berate of tests. It's like blood work, it's EKGs, it's uh, sleep apnea tests, and a whole bunch of other stuff. And he gives you reports and then builds a custom plan to say, hey, well, this is where you're missing your, your supplementation. This is where you have food sensitivity issues. This is what your hormones look like and how we can go and fix these either naturally or with drugs. And they lay out all the options. And if you start doing the things that these people tell you, and this isn't smoke and mirrors, by the way, if, if people want to go and, and, and look up and, and learn more about this. Oh, I agree a thousand percent, by yeah. the way. So another testimonial over here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go 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 right now and Google Gary Brecca or go watch some TikTok videos of what that guy's talking about. He's he's worked with Grant Cardone and uh, uh, what's his face over at UFC, Dana White. Um, like the guy's really well known. He's not a doctor. He's a biologist. But what that guy is talking is a lot of what wellness doctors will do for you. And since I've done that and, and focused on me and gotten the other areas of my health and fitness dialed in, like everything else got better along with it. Yeah, man. You just mentioned Grant. I've had him on my podcast a couple of times and he's in his like mid sixties now. Yeah. He has more energy than anybody on the planet. So that's just a testament to what Gary's doing. Yeah, for sure. He is a, uh, he is a ball of energy. Uh, we spoke at an event together uh, in October, 2021 in Vegas. So I got to meet him there uh, for the first time, which is cool. Yeah, that is cool. Well, good for you, man. I In my book, actually in the second half of the book, I have 100 healthy, wealthy, and happiness related habits that I've implemented. Mm -hmm. And you already touched on a bunch of the ones related to health that I'd recommend. So my wife, she works uh, for a naturopathic healthcare company that does like the food sensitivity testing and hormones and everything like that. So yeah, I'm dialed into all of it. And I pay a lot of attention to my health because you know, it, it all boils down to the following sentence. Mm -hmm. Healthy people have a thousand wishes. Sick people only have one. Mm. And that's to become healthy again. Yeah. So avoid ending up in that situation. Yeah, totally, man. Totally. I, I, I've been in some situations already with my health where because I wasn't taking care of me or my stress levels got too high, certain things started to happen, which were not fun. Um, and, and you really need to focus and take care of yourself. So anyone who's listening to this, who's not putting emphasis on taking care of themselves at this point, like I would say both of us right now, urge you to go and, and take a look into that because if you do it and you commit to it, it will literally change your life. Yeah, I think so too. You know, there's, uh, so on my podcast, I've interviewed Peter Diamandis who co-wrote mm -hmm. life force with Tony Robbins and they, they, they do all the testing and recommend it too. Yeah. And I had, uh, I had Dr. David Sinclair who wrote a book called lifespan, which is about longevity and kind of minimizing the damage to your body when you're young mm -hmm. so that you don't end up having to deal with that when you're a little bit older. It's about vitality. It's like when I'm yeah. 80, I want to be able to walk up the stairs and go to my grandkids baseball games and not have to be a burden to everybody else yeah. around me. Like you can be, you can be an 80 year old that acts like a 60 year old, or you can be, you know, a 60 year old that acts like an 80 year old. Both yeah. of those realities it's up to you. It is, you know, um, I, I'm, I'm a big observer, right. And I have been my whole life and I observe situations. I observe people that, you know, I have relationships with, whether it's friends, family, or a spouse. Uh, and one of the things that I try to observe often is not necessarily what lessons of, of what to do, but also what not to do based on someone else's actions or the situation that they find themselves in. 
And um, if anyone's listening to this, they're probably gonna get pissed off, but I, I don't care at this point in my life. So too fucking bad. Uh, my parents taught me exactly what not to do when it comes to physical fitness and taking care of themselves. Right. Uh, my mom is uh, in her early seventies. So is my dad. Uh, they, they're both in awful physical shape because they haven't put themselves for, and you know what? I think a lot of it's probably generational. A lot of it was, you know, they, they don't, they, they don't have access to the education that you and I do today with this fancy thing called the internet, All right? We have information at our fingertips that our parents never had. Um, and I, I think there's just a generational gap there as well, as far as, you know, what gets prioritized. I think there is a gap in information, but I think that if you go back a hundred years, maybe they wouldn't be in, t- in, in terrible physical shape, even mm-hmm. without the information. But like today's food is just terrible. so bad. <laughs> like the, I mean, all the things Gary talks about too, right? Mm-hmm. Like the seed oils, all the added sugars, the processed stuff, the preservatives, mm-hmm. the access to, to thousands of calories inside of a Starbucks like coffee. I mean, it's ridiculous. Yeah. And so I think, yeah, I think today that generation is a victim of lack of information, mm-hmm. but also just like the worst, like we have the opportunity to eat the best yeah. living in the US, but also the opportunity to eat the worst mm-hmm. compared to like any other time in human history. Yeah. Well, anything that's convenient to eat pretty much is going to be the worst. That's just the reality. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it is. So what's your, what's uh, now I know we're not talking about books anymore, but I've read a lot of this in books, which is useful, sure. but like, what's your, what's your food intake look like now? Like, what are you focused on eating? Um, I'm not really dialed in right now. Like I have been in the past. Um, for me, I, I've been following this. So I, I my, my trainer, Mark, he's a really good close friend of mine too. And um, I've learned a lot from him in all areas of life, right? He's just, he's a well-versed guy. And he's got this rule and it's like, hey, if you're going to come work with me, you got to promise me one thing. And it's the don't eat like an asshole rule. <laughs> like he goes, it's that simple, right? And and like some of the things that he preaches really make sense, you know? And like, I remember my mom even telling me this as a kid, like, hey, uh, you don't have to eat everything that's on your plate. Eat half of it or eat three quarters of it and stop and then see if your body says, oh, okay, I'm actually full. Well, I mean, here I am 20, 30 years later, and and my good friend Mark tells me the same thing. Hey, if you're going to go out to the restaurant and get a burger, you want to eat a fat, greasy burger? Cool. Get it. Get all the bacon, all the crap on it, too. Cut that sucker in half and eat just half of it. And he goes, package the rest of it and take it home. He goes, I guarantee you'll be full. You know what? He's right most of the time. Um, when, when it comes to, to dialing things in a bit more, if I'm, if I'm doing something like 75 hard or, or any of the physical fitness and mental health uh, challenges like that, um, I will usually follow a calorie count uh, for a diet that seems to work really well with, with my body type. Uh, and I'll usually stick to it. Like um, last time I did 75 hard, we stuck to a 3000 calorie or less uh, per day. And that's, that's a good amount of food. If, and again, if you're eating healthy food at 3000 calories, that's a lot of food. It People is, don't yeah. think understand that. Like you can go and smash four slices of pizza and get your three thousand calories, okay? <laughs> um, but if you're eating real clean food, like three thousand calories is a ton of food. And if you can't stay full on that, then there's probably something wrong with you. Yeah. Well, I've done seventy five hard a couple of times. My focus is always around fasting. Mm-hmm. So I'll follow a very strict intermittent fasting schedule and try to condense yeah. my eating window. Yeah. So here's a fun, you know, it's kind of like cutting your food in half. It's just one of those things that people don't teach you. I read a book called Fast This Way by Dave Asprey. Dave's a biohacker extraordinaire, just like Gary and those guys. Yep. And so Dave said, imagine the United States made this weird rule where you had to fill up your car, even if it was empty, three times a week, Monday, mm-hmm. Wednesday, Friday at noon or something like that. And like, let's say you didn't drive Monday afternoon or Tuesday, but you have to go fill up your car on Wednesday, even though you don't need gas. That would be a weird rule. But in the US, we have this strange thing where we have to eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner seven days a week. Who Mm -hmm. made that up? That's not how people ate thousands of years ago. And it's not how we need to eat today. If you're not hungry, what's the point Mm -hmm. of filling up the gas tank? And Mm -hmm. so for me, I don't eat breakfast anymore. Like I remember being a a college kid or like a recent college graduate and literally having 10 eggs a morning Mm. right after a gym workout or right before a gym workout, because I was like, I've got to eat as much as possible. Now the thought of eating before noon, like I I don't even think I can force food down my throat. Right. (laughs) So it's just, it's so funny how that works. 
Yeah, it is. Um, I, I think a lot of it has to do too with, as you get deeper into the physical fitness thing too, um, it, it all depends on what goals you have too. Because if you're someone who's looking to put on size as far as mass for bodybuilding and so on and so forth, like you're, you're going to eat more than you actually want to. Right? Yes. You have to. You have to consume a ton of food to, to stack on the mass. Um, that's never been my goal. Like I've always been a big, thick, muscular guy, even when I wasn't working out. And um, for me, it's always been, hey, I need to actually cut some of the bullshit out so I can lose some of the fat. Mm -hmm. And if I can, if I can do that, then the muscles that I already do have in place are going to start to show and pop like they should be. Um, so I really haven't had to do too much of that. And I, I, I don't, I, I have no interest in getting on stage in uh, a banana hammock uh, and getting myself all spray tan. <laughs> I, I, I respect it. I respect the hell out of it, but yeah. I, I don't want to do it for myself personally. Um, so I think, I think a lot of it has to do with what goals you have as far as, you know, what you're trying to achieve. Um, and I, I think it's, it's something where, you know, talk about like uh, stuff we learned in books, visualization, for instance, right? Close your damn eyes and visualize the ideal version of you. Like just, just do it. See who you can truly become. If you, if you had to look at yourself and say, oh my God, like I, I want to be a, a Greek God or look like one of them damn statues. Okay, cool. Go visualize it. Cause the way it's always worked for me, and this has been in business. This has been when I was a custom car audio installer. This has been, you know, helping clients. This has been, you know, uh, hey, let's go build a house. If I can visualize it, I can go build it. I can make it a reality. Yeah, I think so too. I think a lot about that. Mm -hmm. And like the question that I try to ask myself all the time is what am I optimizing for? Very similar to the vision question. Yeah. And like for me today, as far as diet, nutrition, and fitness, I'm trying to optimize for the most amount of energy. Like I want to feel energized all day, every day. I don't want to experience a crash. I want to feel really good. Yeah. And so I exercise first thing in the morning and I try to get my heart rate up and the blood pumping and do the breathing and everything like that so that I can have those exercise endorphins carry me through the rest of the day. Mm -hmm. I also fast in the morning and I don't eat because that's when I'm crystal clear yeah. because I'm not focused on digestion. I'm not inflamed. I'm not lethargic. I'm like dialed in, you know? Yeah. And, uh, so, so that's what I've been focused on recently. Like, I just want to have the most energy possible because I'm building a business. Yeah. I'm working for a bunch of authors, putting out my first book. Like mm -hmm. I got to show up right now. It's three 12 in the afternoon. I just had my first meal, like 30 minutes. Well, right before we started our podcast yeah. and, uh, I can go for 12 more hours and, and I wouldn't even miss a beat. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Yeah. I love it. All right. So let's switch gears here for a second. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about your marketing agency, and then I want to dive into a little bit more about your book. Um, tell me about the marketing agency. What exactly is, is it that you help authors with? Sure. So I'll tell you how it started. Mm -hmm. Once I found this world of personal development, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, these other books, I was working a full-time job. By the way, it was in transportation management technology sales. So I would sell TMS solutions to trucking companies. And like we would partner with a bunch of companies that would do exactly what you did. So we got to mm -hmm. touch base on that in a minute. But um, as I'm working this job and I'm applying all the sales and marketing and communication books I'm reading, my income starts to skyrocket. Like mm -hmm. I'm making more at a small business than all my friends that were to big fancy companies. Right. Yeah. And I, so I start sharing that with people on social media. Like these are the books I'm reading. This is what I'm getting from them. You should read them too. Just kind of telling everybody. And Authors started to reach out to me and they'd say, hey, Nick, your audience is a good fit for my book. Can I pay you for a book review? Because mm. that's like a marketing opportunity for them. Sure. They pay me, I review the book, and then I sell it to my community. Yep. So I start doing a bunch of paid book reviews. Now I'm getting paid to read. That's pretty fun. And mm. I knew I wanted to work in the space full time one day. So I would always follow up with these authors and I'd say, hey, is there anything else that I could try? Like I know everybody wants to sell more books. I mean, think about it. You're an author. You, you learn something over the course of decades. You spend a year or two putting it into a book mm -hmm. and then nobody buys it. Like that stinks. So I really wanted to figure it out because I believed in the power of these books. So I tried a lot of things that didn't work. I found a few things that did and I would do more of those and continue to try to improve the services and kind of fast forward until today, we work with hundreds of authors a year. Mm -hmm. So there's really three things that we do for authors. And they're all focused on creating more attention for the author's book, but also the complementary products and services that they have behind the scenes. Like everybody's a business owner that I help. 
whether they just do speaking, coaching, mm -hmm. consulting, or they have a, some other type of business. Sure. So service number one is we help them turn their book into mm -hmm. short form content for social media, like video content. So we fly out, we bring the cameras, we bring the lighting, we map out the concepts in their book and the podcast they're doing. And then we make each video fit the following format, a strong hook to grab attention, a really strong piece of value that you can deliver to the audience that retains that person through the whole video. And then a call to action at the end to buy the book or coaching or consulting or speaking or whatever. So that's service number one. Number two, we do podcast booking so we can place authors on up to 100 shows to talk about their book and their business. And then number three, we have a community of about 200,000 followers across all our socials, but about 150K on IG. We have the podcast and stuff. So we get paid to do book reviews still today. Hmm. And uh, that generates uh, more than you would think for the business yeah. uh, because a lot of people their book is a business card for something bigger. And so for every book they can sell, there's a chance to make a lot of money on the back end. And um, that's what we do. You know, I know that was kind of a mouthful, but no, it's, yeah. that, that's perfect, man. It's, it's pretty simple. You got three, three, you know, branches that come off your company and how you help people. Uh, you mentioned something there that I think the listeners to this podcast need, need to understand. Uh, you said that the book is a business card. And uh, it was once told to me by uh, a guy that I was uh, paying to coach me that the book is your best business card you'll ever have. Yeah. Cause um, people can't throw it away. Bingo. Like, cause I dude, you're probably like me. If someone hands you a business card, I'm you're lucky if I take a photograph of that or send it to my VA to drop it into the CRM. Otherwise like nine times out of 10, that sucker's going right in the trash. The next time I get a, a trash can in front of me. So yeah. like, to the point, like I don't even buy business cards anymore because I don't want people throwing my business cards out. If I'm going to go spend, you know, a couple hundred bucks on them. Um, but if you hand somebody a book, especially if you sign the damn book, uh, nine times out of 10, even if that person doesn't read, they are never going to throw this thing out, right? This is nine 99 on Amazon. It's nothing crazy, but no one's going to throw this out. If I give it to them, they're going to take it and they're going to stick it in the bookshelf. They're going to stick it on a coffee table. Even if they never touch it or look at it ever again, it's not, it's not going anywhere. Yeah. So what does, so somebody reads the book. Uh, they're interested in learning more about you. Mm -hmm. What other, you know, how do you leverage the book? Like somebody jumps on your website or your socials, yeah. like how can they spend money? Is it through yeah. coaching? There's, there's calls to action in the book that drives them to uh, my personal branded website. So uh, I wrote the book long before Step It Up Academy was a thing. Uh, so I have, I have thomaskeenan.com as, as my personal branded website. So it directs people over to that website. There is a book goodies downloadable that basically gives them a couple of different worksheets and actions to go through. Uh, from the book itself and they get to opt in they get added to the email list the whole nine yards and uh, then we can kind of just bring them through and nurture them and and you know stay in contact with them moving forward i mean listen you know the way marketing works you're on the list you're on the list <laughs> yeah we got to work together man you're my ideal client <laughs> yep. but yeah we help authors like you get more exposure because it is tough like you know it's tough you yeah. could do all the right things and people still don't buy the book yeah and so you know i like I said, we have a community of people that are looking for a new book recommendation every day. And I think that's, you know, that's the audience that I built my entire business from. Yeah. That's awesome. Congratulations on that too. All right. <clears throat> so moving forward here, let's talk about your book, right? You got some cool things in there. You said it's 15 hour damn audio book, which is crazy long, which I think is awesome, by the way. It's a lot of material in there. Um, but what, what inspired you to actually take the plunge and become an author? Well, listen, as I built my community, I received thousands of messages over the years and they would always have the same questions. Like, mm -hmm. how do I choose the right book? You know, uh, how do I take notes? Like you had asked before, how do I take action from these books? Like, why am I reading them? But nothing happens in my life. And so I'd always answer everybody. I'd send a voice note, a DM, I'd jump on a Zoom call. Like I'm of service to my community, yeah. but I always felt like I was underserving them for two reasons. Number one, the format with which I was answering never really gave me the opportunity to explain everything that I had to offer. But the other thing was like, I also never took the time to observe my own behavior and translate exactly what I was doing to the page. Mm -hmm. So I didn't take the time to articulate and define exactly what I was doing. So the book sort of forced me to do that. And I would have loved if there was another resource out there available that I could point people to because this book took way too much of my time to create. 
Mm. But um, I am happy, like as a result of this process, I have really nailed in exactly what I want to teach people. So yeah, if you're somebody in the audience today and you're just starting your personal development reading journey, or maybe you're even into it, like you've been reading a ton of books, you're just not getting enough out of them, then my book is for you. Because I do think these books have the opportunity to change our lives, to solve problems, to help us develop skill sets. Mm -hmm. And if you're not using them, then you're living under your potential. Like I'll plant my flag and I'll say that we're all capable of doing more. Mm -hmm. Might as well read from people who have figured it out. And that's what's so great about these books. Yeah, man. I love it. I think that's awesome. Congratulations on you for taking the plunge and doing the hard work because it's it's a chore. Like people don't realize <laughs> it, but it, it's it's a chore. My, mine took me eight months start to finish. Um, and it was <clears throat> I had a team of people that were helping me as, as far as editors and stuff were concerned. But it, it was it was work, dude. Uh, and I was still running a business full time at that point. So the work happened after hours. And it, it, it Same took here, yeah. a lot of late nights and, you know, staying up until two in the morning, just grinding to get things done. And that's the kind of shit behind the scenes that no one gets to see. They get to see the finished piece. They get to see the, the tangible copy of the book when it comes in, in, and hits them after they Amazon it or, or order from your website or something. So that's awesome, man. Congratulations. And, and uh, if, if no one's told you yet, I'm proud of you for taking the plunge because it's not an easy one to take, dude. Thank you. And proud of you for doing the same. I have so much more respect for my clients as a result of going through the process myself, because mm. I think I underestimated it a little bit. And now I now I know what it actually takes. You know, it's funny you say that. <clears throat> and I, I totally get what you're saying as far as, you know, now you can you you, you can connect with your clients better because you understand the process. Um, I have this theory with projects. OK, I, and this comes back from my days working blue collar, working in cars, you know, building crazy custom audio systems. This comes back to my days of, you know, doing home improvement projects around the house. This comes back to my days of doing projects like writing books. There comes this point in any project, when it's a big project, usually around the midpoint or a little bit past the midpoint where you say, holy shit, what did I get myself into? <laughs> and you, you question all of your decisions that led up to that very moment. You're like, man, I hope I made the right choice here. And you have this moment where you're like, is it too late to pull a plug? Because if I quit now, like no harm, no foul, right? And it's in that moment where you have to decide to push through, push forward and just finish it out and make it a reality. That happens to me every single mm -hmm. time I get in the ice bath. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, yeah the, the three or four minutes you're, you're in the ice bath, we'll, we'll, we'll definitely do it to you. Yes, but yeah, it happens with projects too. I can totally relate. Yeah, love it, dude. Man, I appreciate you uh, coming in here today and jamming with us and giving us some really good value and whatnot. I got one last question to ask you before we do the normal podcast exit. Um, of all of the books that you've read, you got a massive bookshelf behind you and it's color coded, which I think is really cool, by the way. Don't think I didn't pick up on that. <laughs> of all of the books you've read since you started diving into the self-development arena, give me your top three books that you'd recommend. $100 million offers by Alex mm -hmm. Hormozzi. Yep. That book made me six figures of additional revenue within a couple months of reading it. Talk about yeah. ROI. Mm -hmm. The Four Hour Work Week by Tim Ferriss. Yep. As a result of reading that book, I've traveled to 25 different countries for up to three months at a time and mm -hmm. built a remote business and automated, delegated, eliminated everything that I didn't want to do and yeah. focused more on what I did want to do. And The Compound Effect by Darren Hardy. Small mm -hmm. steps in the right direction over a long period of time will lead to a great life. Yeah. And uh, How Do You Eat an Elephant One Bite at a Time? So mm -hmm. those three books. Love it, man. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I think that's some, some good insight there that the audience can pick up on. They can go grab those books and learn some more. And most importantly, grab your book. Uh, with that being said, where can we go connect with you? Where can we find your book when it launches? Uh, November 1st, by the way, we're going to we're gonna try and get this podcast launched right around that time as well. So it, it hits real hard. Um, but yeah, where can we connect with you? If anybody wants a custom book recommendation because they don't know where to start, then DM me at bookthinkers on Instagram. It's spelled just like it sounds, bookthinkers. And tell me about a problem you have. Tell me about a skill you want to develop or something in between. You mm -hmm. get all sorts of requests when you run a book community yeah. and I'll probably ask some follow-up questions, but I'll provide a custom book recommendation to you. Anybody that's listening today, free of charge. And I'll even follow up with you in three months to make sure that you've read the book. So mm -hmm. that's my, uh, that's my ask for everybody today. And then from there, you can find links to the book and everything else that we do. Cool, man. Love it. Uh, See, so you know what? You're a marketing pro and I can tell because you gave one call to action. 
A confused customer always says no. So you got to make it clear. (laughs) Very true. I appreciate you, brother. This has been great. Yeah, thank you so much. I really appreciate the opportunity. You talked about gratitude earlier, so I'm grateful for you. Thank you. Nice, man. Thank you for tuning in to the Step It Up Entrepreneur Podcast. Make sure you head over to stepitupentrepreneur.com and make sure you subscribe so you never miss an episode of the Step It Up Entrepreneur Podcast.